Right, I can see we've got a good number of uh, participants. So, um, hello and welcome to this exclusive event from the Alliance of Independent Agencies. Uh, my name is Callum Saunders and I'm the Strategy Group Chair at the Alliance and Planning Director at Zeal Creative. In today's session, we will be hearing from one of the Alliance's member agencies, Opinion, who will be presenting the findings from their latest Most Connected Brands study. Now in its third year, this research focuses on the disruptive influence of the pandemic and the movers and shakers, those brands who have moved up and down in the rankings alongside those who have performed strongly to connect with consumers and shoppers over the past year. The research will be presented by Wes Ethorn, a research director at Opinium, followed by a panel session led by Debbie Shuttlewood, also a research director at Opinium, who will introduce the panel uh, attendees and session after the main event. If anyone has any questions at all, please add these to the Q&A function, not the chat function, and we will do our best to answer these if we have any time at the end of the session. If not, we will ensure that we get back to everyone with answers to their questions. So I'm really excited about the next hour ahead. There's some great stuff coming up from Opinion. So please enjoy this Alliance event and over to Wes at Opinion to kick us off. Hi everyone, welcome to the session. Uh, I'm Wes Ethorn, a research director at Opinion, uh, and I work on the, the team that have pulled together the most connected brand um, study. This is in its third year now in the UK, so really fascinating to look at the changes, look at the uh, in incredible impact that the pandemic has had on certain sectors. Uh, and also, um, this will be the second year for the study being in the US as well. So um, if you're you know, curious about uh, whether any of the sort of the, there's parallels between the UK and the US, then uh, there'll be a, a study out shortly in the US as well. Um, but without further ado, I will share my screen and uh, introduce you to the study. Great. So hopefully you can uh, you can see my screen. Um, so just a little bit of background about the most connected brand study. We know that there are a huge number of different um, ranking studies out there, um, but we wanted to do something a little bit different in that the, the, the purpose of most connected brands is it's really to give voice to the consumer. So to let them tell us which brands they connect with, which brands are kind of fundamental to everyday life in their world. Um, so it, it's not put together by an industry of experts. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, put together by some kind of hidden algorithm that no one really understands. It's actually directly from the consumers themselves, both in terms of the list that we use, the brands that actually make the cut to be asked as part of the study. Uh, and most importantly of all, how those brands actually perform uh, when compared to other iconic brands within the UK. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the methodology, uh, we spoke to um, 6,000 nationally representative consumers. Um, they conducted over 46,000 brand reviews. So you can imagine it's incredibly robust, incredi incredibly representative uh, of the population. And they, uh, in terms of the, the spontaneous brands um, that were asked as part of the study, they were derived from over 5,000 spontaneous brand mentions. So as I mentioned, even the, even the brands that are included in the study, we didn't want to put our own clients in there or clients we'd love to work with, though secretly, obviously, that would be fantastic. But it was more to let organically the brands that we all live with that are ubiquitous in our daily lives uh, are the ones that should appear at the list. So again, the list itself was derived from those spontaneous brand mentions from, uh, from the uh, nationally representative sample we spoke to. Uh, in terms of the measures uh, that we use, they, they're fundamentally four measures um, focused on the very different ways that we can form relationships with brands. So for example, you have emotion. So that's um, brands that we just have that kind of almost, um, you know, immediate instinctive reaction to that visceral sort of I love that brand or I hate that brand often you won't even you know recognize why you feel that way about that brand but something you've got that emotional relationship with uh, the second measure is dynamism which uh, is obviously particularly important for, for new challenger brands uh, new brands entering uh, markets so are you a brand that's just seen as the now there's a certain buzz around you you know the, there's a sense that lots of brands that you know people are talking about you and people are using you increasingly so do you have that kind of social traction uh, and then prominence is a measure that measures essentially the, uh, the, the the scale of the brand, the presence of the brand. So are you a brand that appears on every single high street across the land? Are you a, a brand that appears in every single cupboard um, you know, across the country? So do you have that sort of natural presence and scale uh, that can often come with huge size and with, with lots and lots of history? Uh, and then finally, distinction. So are you a brand that's seen as a, a bit of a leader, a bit of a trendsetter, um, offering something different, potentially in a, in a category where everyone is selling fairly similar products, but you've got something about your brand or the products that you sell that just kind of sets you apart from, from you know, from the rest. 
uh, we didn't just cover those those core measures because we are I wanted to understand you know beyond just you know the, the power of, the, of each brand the equity that's latent within each brand why is that so uh, we wanted to understand a little bit more about the individuals we spoke to uh, as well as the brands themselves so we understood a little bit more about their demographics and life stage psychographics so how do they see themselves as, as, as an individual you know what's important to them uh, what media they consume um, so are you someone who's always actively on social media or are you someone who you know potentially you know swerves towards more terrestrial sort of mainstream uh, you know more traditional I guess media media elements uh, and then also understand a bit about the brands themselves so are you someone as an individual who just really thinks that a brand should do more you should have a real purpose it should give back to society care about the environment those sort of things uh, and uh, as an individual are you someone who's an early adopter of, of technology so will you always be that person who's got the brand new smartphone that's just been released this week but then again just to understand the why behind the brands so um, so we can understand what it is that specifically each brand um, does that's uniquely different uh, we asked some imagery statements uh, we asked about their personality uh, and uh, for this we used uh, implicit response testing so as well as asking which statements they would agree with uh, we actually measured the, the speed of response so we could see is it something that's hardwired into your belief around that brand or is it something that you like to take a little bit more time you need to process it take it to you know your kind of system system two thinking before you agree that that statement actually applies to that brand and then finally and one of the most important things of all in, in retrospect is just understanding the consequences that the pandemic has had I mean it's 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 you know had a seismic impact on the way we live the way we shop where we work i mean there's, there's barely a, you know any any aspect of our life that is untouched by the pandemic so it was obviously really really important that we we you know we know we noticed that we noted that within the the research uh, so we've got some questions around whether people have been in, you know impacted by the pandemic and, and if so in what way so the first section will be just to explain well, what are the most connected brands? You know, what's the rank order uh, of the brands that appear? The second section will be focused on some of the trends that we've seen, and again, particularly related to the pandemic. As I say, some sectors have been incredibly, incredibly affected by the pandemic. So it's obviously um, very important that we focus on that. And then the third section will be what we call brand stories. So this is where we've looked at um, certain brands that perform particularly well. On, on, on a dimension of our framework and then we explain why we you know what, what's the strategy what is it about that brand that ensures that it performs so in, you know so well on that and also going back to our ethos that the whole point of the most connected brand study is that it's giving voice to a consumer um, we'll actually bring in some video vox pops so uh, we've uh, we've got some consumer vox pops of people talking about brands that they have a particular strong connection with uh, and just explaining why well, you know what is it about that brand what is it that brand does or sells or the, the purpose it has or the the leadership that it has um, you know that, that makes that brand stand out to, to that individual so hopefully that will you know rather than listening to me talk about it we'll actually bring some real life human beings in uh, to talk about why you know why they feel so closely connect, uh, connected to uh, to their brands. So without further ado, uh, this is the top 100. Uh, and when we uh, initially saw this, the, the first time would have been, well, I think, three years ago now, um, what we are pleased with was just how diverse the list of brands is. There's no one sector that it favours. Uh, it doesn't favour brand new brands over traditional brands. Uh, it shows that the power of a brand isn't dictated by a sector or, you know, a generation. It shows that, you know, that if, if you if you invest in a brand, you build a brand, you have a very clear purpose for it, then there's a place for you on the list. So you've got brands as varied as, for example, the first time this year we've, we've seen the NHS appear, the NHS shot into second place, uh, which bearing in mind the backdrop of what we've all gone through for the past year makes complete and total sense. But it's probably not traditionally viewed as, as, as a brand. Um, so this year it was quite unique to see it there. And in the same list, you've got ASOS, which, you know, is this, this you know, the revolutionising the way that we shop and the way we buy, you know, um, leisure attire and, and fashion, um, but brand new uh, and, and a really disruptive brand. So you've got a brand that's been around since, you know, the, was it 1948 in the NHS and then a pretty, a relative newcomer in the ASOS, all on the same list, completely different categories. So that's, uh, that's something we were, you know, really pleased with when we saw the list. Uh, we also wanted to look at brands that are performing particularly well on certain aspects of uh, the most connected brand framework. So 
emotion, you know, potentially unsurprisingly, sitting at the top there, you've got the NHS, which again, over the course of the past year, I, I've stood outside my own house and clapped, clapped the carers and so on. I mean, they've, they've played such an incredible role, in, you know, in, in the past year. Um, so unsurprisingly, they've performed particularly well on emotion. Prominence, Amazon, um, potentially in a way, I guess, a surprise in that they don't have such, you know, they don't have a physical sort of, you know, stores on every single street corner, like, you know, some of the major retailers, but they are that kind of that, that that brand that you know they're almost omnipresent every single channel you go to every time i'm online I'll, I'll in some ways you know feel like i'm interacting with amazon so you know they've really pushed the boundaries of what's possible with you know a virtual uh, a, a virtual world uh in terms of distinction we've got some interesting brands which we'll talk about a bit more later but you've got the likes of lego which you know on the surface has got just about the most copyable um, core product, as you can imagine, which is, you know, why they're, you know, so fiercely litigious about anyone trying to copy that product. But, you know, they've gone beyond that, um, you know, to become so much more than, you know, a, a brand that just sells, you know, plastic blocks that encourage design and, and you know, um, core skills with children. And we'll talk about them in, in, in a bit more depth. And then you've got dynamism. And again, how incredible that, uh, uh, you know, a, a brand, if you like, the NHS or a service, you know, service provider that's been around since, you know, just, just post the Second World War, is seen as a brand that's that's dynamic with social traction with with you know momentum and buzz um versus all of these kind of you know, these these new sort of digital uh, brands so you know it just shows the the variety of what a brand represents on each of these different measures so looking at some of the um, the big what we've called the movers and shakers but the brilliant thing about the study is that we are now in the third year of the study we've got the ability to look at trends over time look at brands that are on the way up brands that are maybe on the way down we can even dig into certain generational differences as well um so these are five core trends that we've noticed um the, across the across the most connected brand um, ranking this year. The first one being, um, and all of these, are, I, I, you know, won't be surprising to everyone. Uh, it has fundamentally changed the past year, as, as you know, the way we work, where we work, how we work, um, has changed for you know pretty much everyone. You know, certainly, certainly I know. So that has you know had a huge impact on the brands that have performed well within the most connected brand um, study. Um, and there's a beautiful dichotomy, and I, I, I suspect a few people might empathise with it, in that we saw, uh, particularly during lockdown, where um, pretty much um, you know, looking after yourself, looking after your body, um, exercising was pretty much the only release we had, um, the only legal release from our houses. So we did see there was a bit of an explosion in the brands that performed particularly well um, linked to health and wellness. But then, uh, interestingly, there's a dichotomy in that we saw the uh, other brands that performed particularly well were comfort brands. So brands that, you know, you buy over a counter, give you a sugar hit, make you feel a bit better about life as well. Um, so we'll talk about that. The third um, trend we saw was that, again, particularly during, you know, the first one or two lockdowns, um, you know, people were looking for escapism. Real life was scary enough. So, you know, having having something like, you know, a Netflix to, to, to stream an entire series and just lose yourself, um, you know, escape reality, um, you know, was a fundamental shift that we saw. Um, one of the sectors that performed uh, or really suffered, unsurprisingly, were was retail, um, particularly at the points you know during lockdown, where unless you have termed a non-essential shop, um, you weren't able to operate as a business. Um, so uh, we have seen as a, there's been a real you know a real difference in the brands that have fared well, the retailers that have performed badly. Uh, you know a lot of that has been essentially or made dictatorial, you know, based on on government announcements. And then the final and, and fifth trend we saw. Initially, it was quite a positive one. So we saw that we uh, public transport um, uh, was a, was a concern for people. Um, so as a result, we did see that in the likes of TfL and even now, I mean, it's, um, we, we've not we're not we're not seeing the same numbers of of people on on transport for London or on public transport. So there was this sense of oh, is this it? Is this going to be the one positive that we take from this? Is that it's affected how we feel about the environment? You know, at the start of the pandemic, there were all these wonderful pictures of blue skies in India for the first time in in decades. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about you know how that has affected brands that you know potentially linked to the energy sector as well so with the first trend changing how we work and where we work so um obviously a lot of people are now working from home uh, with hybrid lifestyles um picking their own calendars you know scheduling their own days um so there's a lot more freedom um to, to work to your own schedule so as a result of that we did see a lot of brands that allowed that to happen 
you know, over this, the course of, you know, just thinking of, of opinion, for example, we literally left on a Friday and by Monday we had laptops that were connected to absolutely everything. Everyone had a laptop and we got those delivered to us by the Monday morning. Um, so all the brands that made that possible, these technology providers, suddenly, the, you know, the word teams, which I, I genuinely I barely heard before the pandemic happened, all of these brands that allowed us to carry on working without, a, you know, without a beat, they're the brands that have really benefited. So Microsoft, HP and Dell, uh, but also brands that that have affected where we work so the amount of people particularly in, in lockdowns one and two who were you know suddenly that i'd see them uh, talking to me from their sheds and lots of home improvement work was going on we you know we've been anchored to our homes we spend a lot more time there than we ever have. So that's when you start to, you know, start to spit all these, you know, spot all these imperfections, things you wish you'd changed or you need to build a new office for you for you to work from. So again, those are the sort of brands that have really benefited. Then looking at health and wellness. So again, really positive in, 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 in one turn in that you've got Nike shooting up the rankings. You've got Fitbit appearing as the, you know, for the first time. So you, you, a personal trainer that sits on your wrist, how, how incredible is that? But then again, that, that beautiful dichotomy in that we as human beings, yes, you want to go and work out and feel better about ourselves and have the freedom of the outdoors but also when we get home you know you just want to settle down you you know enjoy enjoy the you know the, the fruits of your labor uh you, you know bearing in mind lockdown one was a pretty you know scary depressing time for everyone so having some comfort um that you feel you've earned at the end of the day is why two such different sectors have have actually performed quite quite well on the list uh the third trend we've seen is that um never have, have, have we been you know more frightened we we, we as a kind of um as a as a nation went through a trauma even as you know as a, as a kind of globally um every every country will have gone through you know this this sense of desperation i'm locked in at home i'm having to home care i just need some kind of escape some release and again the brands that um allowed that you know gave us uh, the ability to lose ourselves in a box set you know game of thrones or whatever it might be brands that have given us um you know ability like lego for example to you know, when we're home school and when we just need children to you know to have an hour to you know to enjoy themselves whilst we get some work done lego have allowed us to do that um same you know with disney and nintendo and what's wonderful as well it's not just that people are increasingly sitting in front of screens and uh, uh, you know and, and and watching box sets even the national trust uh, you know this greater realization that we do need to you know we do enjoy being out of the house we do enjoy going for walks or jogging and enjoying uh, enjoying the countryside now our local communities so the likes of the national trust appear in there is, is fantastic as well uh, and also uh, the fourth trend and, and, and probably one of the you know the biggest um i guess casualties of the pandemic have been um stores that were deemed uh, non-essential so brand they literally overnight had to shutter uh, let go staff um so the likes of primark and new look um also i mean our changing lifestyles in that a lot of people are, are a lot less focused on how they dress not having to buy outfits for work quite so much because we're not commuting uh, to the degree we were um those are brands that have really not performed as, as well as they would have liked obviously as a result of the pandemic but then interestingly you've got brands that are you know were, were termed at times non-essential uh, um so the likes of boots for example which were so important you know during the pandemic just help keeping us safe help you know helping make sure that you know we've all got um the opportunity to to have medicines and so on that maybe not not even necessarily related to the coronavirus itself and then the final uh final um aspect that we wanted to look at was how just the way we've changed in terms of you know our commutes a lot of people are no longer uh, you know probably may never even go back to a five-day commute so there was a lot of fear around public transport and again as i mentioned earlier initially there was a sense of could this be it could this be the one positive that we take from this whole experience is a greater realization about the importance you know of the the world around us and, and caring for it for, for future generations um but interestingly as as we've seen that's not necessarily proven the case so in the longer term uh, the fear factor remains for many people in terms of going onto public transport. So, in a way, that's actually meant a lot of people who probably wouldn't have considered, you know, motor vehicles and and, and so on, uh, have become a lot more aware of of the need for that. Um, and being anchored at home without the you know the ability to use public transport has meant that maybe having a car is seen as as giving you a sense of freedom that that wasn't maybe as as important prior to the pandemic. So we have seen that actually car manufacturers obviously uh, have performed pretty poorly over the course of the pandemic just because of through necessity you know having a workforce that can work nine till five you know six uh, five or six days a week has not been possible. They've been badly affected by disruptions to you know to staff um, staff members. So they've not performed well financially 
financially, but we have seen there's a real appetite for, for, for you know, automotive brands um, as, as people kind of swerve away from public transport. And I guess the one positive, the one um, sense is that maybe some of these new people who are considering, um, you know, a, a, a vehicle, maybe we'll be looking to the likes of Tesla. So that's a new a new brand in, in the rankings up to 60, um, 62nd in, in our list. So, uh, yes, we've probably got a, a lot of new people considering um motor vehicles but hopefully they'll be considering you know more sort of um socially responsible vehicles that, that maybe don't use traditional sort of petrol or diesel and then brand stories so this is where i wanted to just introduce some brands that have performed particularly well on certain dimensions of the most connected brand framework and we'll talk about how they do it in very very different ways so the obvious two to start with were the uh were amazon and the nhs so number one and two in our rankings uh, Amazon has been number one uh, since we started this, um, the study, so three years in a row, that's been ranked number one, whereas NHS was brand new in this year. And I think that's because it isn't seen as a brand, you know, it means so much more uh, to people, but it's been just so important, so present, um, you know, over the course of the past year that, that, that you know, fortunately it made it onto the list this year. Consumers, um, you know, mentioned it as one of their favourite brands. Uh, but it's interesting just how differently those two brands, you know, first and second in the list, but fundamentally different. So you have you have the NHS. Uh, so you have the Amazon that, you know, is this omnipresent sort of, um, you know, brand that I, I see it. I probably have multiple interactions with it every single day. Um, it's everywhere it's always looking to push boundaries it's always looking to improve our lives with you know new services new ways of delivering what we want when we want it um, to our schedule so always looking you know customer first how can we make uh, people's lives better and then the NHS all they want to do is, is save our lives they don't want to be in every every facet of it they just want to make sure we're healthy and happy and looked after so two brands you know incredibly different but actually incredibly powerful in their own right uh, and as I mentioned on the next um, slide, we're hopefully going to go to a video, and this is just the first example where we've actually got consumers talking about what it is about these brands that they absolutely love. What is it that, that you know really draws them to the to Amazon or to uh, NHS? So hopefully the technology will work. I'm a big fan of Amazon mainly because I find the customer service to be excellent, deliveries quick basically do what they say on the tin. I just think it's really good value for money and you can find a lot of stuff all under one roof uh, without having to shop around. It's been really good during the Covid crisis when we need to stay home and we can still get everything we need. I went into early labour with my second child on the 1st of April um, which they managed to stop and then I gave birth at the end of April during the pandemic um, and they've adapted incredibly well. Staff are amazing. They've sacrificed so much during the pandemic. They're currently looking after my father-in-law, who's suffering from terminal prostate cancer at an advanced stage. Um, it's just an incredible organisation, and it does incredible things for the country. The NHS is literally life-saving. Right, and the second, um, and the second. Uh, a set of brands we wanted to look at were Apple and um, and um, Samsung. So two brands that perform, uh, you know, in, a, in a, you know the same sector. Uh, often it can seem a bit of a, a me too sector in that every every brand and product seems to offer the same things. But what's staggering is just how differently both those brands have managed to sort of personify themselves. So Apple, for example, is is always seen as pushing the boundaries and uh, you know it's iconic. It's it's um, to the point where it's almost seen as a bit elitist to, to some, and that's where Galaxy comes, uh, Samsung comes in, in that. They are seen as a lot more universally um, accessible, uh, a brand for people like me. So they have that kind of emotional affinity. So one brand has built itself on innovation and design and technology uh, and really pushing the boundaries. The other brand has, 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 has mirrored that. You know, they, they obviously Samsung develops incredible technology, but they sell it in a way that, that, that feels it's more attainable to, to absolutely everyone out there. So as a result, they've managed to form a, sli form a slightly more emotional relationship with people. And again, over to some uh, consumers for their point of view. I use a range of them, phone, MacBook Pro, watch, Apple TV, um, uh, they all work very well together. Uh, I appreciate how the ecosystem uh, integrates. You can you can trust that they'll bring out new products just to keep better customers uh, ahead, I guess, with uh, the technology. Very cerebral, intelligent, thoughtful, it constantly innovates. 
that it constantly pushes boundaries. I'm quite clumsy with writing, I'd say. So I need something I know that's that's going to last with me. And I've always found that with Samson. I think that they're very high quality. Uh, they don't give any problems. Although some of their products may not be as fashionable as, uh, for example, Apple, um, you know, it's very, very hard to fault them. They're a safe bet. If you're looking to purchase something, uh, you know, you're pretty much all right. Great. And the next trend is looking at uh, the BBC. Um, so for the BBC, we did see some um, some troubling signs when we looked at the generational differences um, in the uh, the brands, um, the, the people that really engage with the BBC as, as a brand are typically in the older age groups. You can see um, that amongst 30 to 49s and uh, 18 to 29s, it's, you know, 44th and 45th respectively. So uh, we have seen that there is, you know, danger that the likes of Netflix uh, are really encroaching on what people expect from entertainment uh, and, and whether they feel that the BBC offer that. So you can see, for example, that... Um, uh, unsurprisingly, Netflix was was fourth in our ranking. It's seen as hugely dynamic, seen as pushing the you know the the boundaries. Uh, and also, it's not just that it provides incredible technology. Um, it, it also uh, you know seeds a sense of emotion as well. So people have a sense of happiness. You know, the brand is able to convey that. Um, well, the brand itself, but also the content that they provide, does give you that sense of escapism. You know, the ability to you know turn a miserable day into a happy day just by nature of the content you watch. Whereas the, the positive news for the BBC is that it still has a huge role to play. People still have an incredibly positive um, point of view of, uh, of the BBC. So it is seen as an icon. It's seen as offering us that security. Uh, and in time of, you know, media fragmentation and social media and, you know, um, people disappearing into their own vacuum where they're getting fed, you know, the, the you know information that's, that's biased and skewed, that there is a, a role to play for the BBC to be that kind of impartial um, advisor, that trustworthy, um, you know, kind of auntie, uh, you know, as, as it was known in the old days, who can just give you the information you need in a completely impartial, trustworthy way. The BBC is just, it's got such a broad reach. Um, it's trustworthy. I think it's very reliable. Um, and it's also entertaining. It's very diverse. The if it kind of impartial views on news um, is always really good and reliable and trustworthy. Um, also just the other services like TV and radio, they're really high quality. I always come back to Netflix. There's always something to watch. I can always find something for the grandchildren, my husband, to watch. Uh, we watch a variety. A fairly gregarious personality, fairly open, um, um, sort of has uh, an inclusive attitude and outlook towards life. I really resonate with them as a brand, someone who's not afraid to take risks, but also someone who uses their knowledge well to find things that work for a lot of people. Uh, and also wanted to look at brands that have managed to forge a, a really strong emotional connection and, and probably a brand that isn't surprising, but we're really pleased to see it appear so highly on, on the list was Heinz in that it is, a, it is a brand that we've, you know, we've grown up, um, you know, uh, enjoying their food. It's almost, you know, part of the family around the dinner table. Uh, and and it, it, it is that kind of ubiquity, you know, the fact that it appears in every single cupboard across the land, seen as iconic, but also probably going beyond that. And the reason it's performed so well is it, you don't just buy the product. You, you do buy the product, you, you buy the brand that comes with the product. You buy that sense of belonging, that sense of comfort, that sense that you've grown up with that brand um, through your, you know, your entire life. Um, it's, you know, it's part of the family. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, is very difficult to, to put, you know, pound and pence uh, value against. You know, it, it is something that, you know, it does take a lifetime in a way to generate that, that sense of, you know, kind of um, familial almost um, relationship with the brand. Well, the supermarket Heinz is still the number one brand when you come to soups, baked beans, spaghetti. I think Heinz is an iconic British brand for me because it taps back right to my childhood and all my favourite foods like baked beans and ketchup. It's just part of British culture, everyday life. Um, and it's good food. 
Great. I always forget that the, the chap there is wearing a dressing gown. Uh, as I say, with, with video capture, you are very much at, um, you know, at, at the individual's <laughs> preferred, preferred mode of communication. So, uh, yes, apologies for that. But, uh, yeah, to show at least it's a real window into people's lives. Um, this slide, there's an awful lot going on. But what I just wanted to do here was contrast two brands that perform particularly well. Uh, in terms of being distinctive uh, and standing out of the crowd. And the first is Lego, which, as I mentioned at the start, incredible, you know, their, their core product is so copyable, but it's the emotion that it brings. You know, it gives, it's a brand that makes us smile. It's seen as iconic. It's, you know, it it's gives us, you know, our, our children the ability to, you know, practice motor skills and develop um, design skills. So they offer so much more than, you know, just, you know, a, a, a label on a product. Uh, and Tester's a really interesting one in that, you know, it's also seen as hugely distinctive, but it's almost, you know, as a result of the power and the personality of, of one man. So, you know, as, as a company, the products they produce are always looking to push the boundaries. Uh, I think the fact that they are that all nearly you know, nearly every product they do seems to benefit. There's a, there's a purpose to it. There's a there's a, a sense it's giving back to the planet. You know, the, uh, you know, in a way that's really conscious about its kind of social uh, impact. Uh, and also as a result of that, it gives us that sense of hope. So that might be, you know, crazy thing of going into, into space or a, a car that you can smash with a sledgehammer. Or it might just be hope that actually if other brands care so much about the environment, then maybe, you know, things could, could improve, you know, in that regard. There is nothing like Lego. It has nostalgia around it. It's distinctive. Everyone knows what it is, and it's something that we've all played with. It gives the opportunity for for children to build, to make things, um, and design things, which is very important. It allows them to use their imagination. One piece of Lego, you can look at it, you know that's Lego. It's so instantly identifiable. It's retained its simplicity. I think we need to end our hydrocarbon addiction, and I feel Tesla will help with this. Having a uh... I'm not sure how to describe it, Elon Musk. An interesting figurehead um, in charge is is also uh, contributes to um, my interest in the brand. The Tesla brand, as a promise owner uh, from the name, is a, a person who's a person who's highly intelligent and has the creativity uh, in terms of technological innovation uh, to match any person. And the final um, brand to just um, turn the spotlight onto is the National Trust. Um, with the pandemic, we've all been anchored to our local communities and I think a, a greater awareness of, of what's possible in our local communities. And I think a greater appreciation um, for, you know, for, for, for the world around us. Um, we have seen that as a brand, this is, you know, shot up um, for the first time it's appeared in the rank um, order. Also, that's driven very much by the, the sense that, it, you know, it is socially responsible. The, the core, um, you know, purpose of, of the National Trust is to look around, you know, look, look, look after the world around us. So we have seen that um, this year as, as, you know, if anything made us so appreciate that so much more. So there is a sense the National Trust, you know, has values we relate to, uh, really represents us, what's important to us, also gives us that sense of belonging and pride at a time when we've really needed it needed it most over the course of the pandemic. Um, so that's everything from me. So uh, now it's over to the panel. So I'd love to hear you know, how, how their businesses and, and the brands they work with have been affected by the pandemic and also what, you know, what dimensions of the framework would their, you know, would their brand perform particularly well on and why? Uh, thanks so much. So some great brand stories there and really lovely to hear in consumers' own words, even if they are wearing dressing gowns, what those brands mean to them. So the second part of our session today, as, as Wes has just mentioned, is a panel discussion where we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the themes that we've just seen. So firstly, I want to introduce you to our panel. So we've got Callum, who you've met. He's switched hats. He's, he's uh, joining our panel today. And with him, we have Joe Harper, e-commerce marketing manager, Western Europe for Kellogg's and Ellen Tesson, Strategy Director at Ogilvy for Social and Content. So thank you very much for joining us today. So obviously one of the big themes arising from the research that, that Wes covered in his presentation was how the pandemic has changed our way of life and the way that we connect with brands. And Wes made the point that no aspects of our lives have been untouched. So let's start here and, and let's start with looking at shopping and Callum I'm going to come to you first so what have you seen over the last gosh 18 months nearly two years now 
in terms of how the pandemic has changed shopper mindsets? It's a great question. It's a really big one, I think, because I always start with coming from a kind of grocery and FMCG background. You know, at, at Zeal, we're, we're experts in grocery and FMCG. And I think, first of all, we had to look at the fact that, you know, shopping itself changed overnight the behavior of shopping the the occasions that we shopped for as we were locked down um we certainly saw a return to to the big weekly shop as people tried to minimize physical uh shopping visits and obviously that huge acceleration in in e-commerce you know and i think at its peak in around june or july it was about 13 percent of all grocery sales which, which is really impressive given it took about 15 years to get to around seven percent so you know shopping itself changed but i think grocery shoppers also needed to shift their mindsets to shop for new occasions so again we we saw the return of things such as the family breakfast obviously really key for for brands such as kellogg's and, and joe and his team um but also new ways to connect with shoppers so if you take the the frozen category for example you know traditionally people are in and during the week we're, we're in an office or a place of work you know but but now with access to to a freezer and an oven at home you know this created new ways for brands to connect and and win with shoppers in in new incremental occasions such as summer al fresco lunches so a bit of a change in terms of grocery mindsets but i think overall the the overall kind of point i want to land is that we've really seen a real fragmentation of shopper mindsets over the past kind of year and a half you know if we get out of our marketing bubble for a moment you know ons data showed that actually over half of people did not work from home last year we've seen a, a growing financial gap between shoppers that have you know lost their jobs or they're coming to the end of, of furlough schemes versus those who are actually a lot more affluent because they're they're saving money on commuting so i think the key thing for me about the change in shopper mindsets is that we are now facing in as marketers into a much more diverse range of mindsets than ever before which is fascinating uh, especially in, in kind of strategic planning and insight but also very challenging as we try to to navigate the months as we come out of the pandemic thanks Cam. i agree it, it really is it really is fascinating so just thinking about the challenges joe can i maybe come to you now what has the pandemic and the way consumers lives have changed meant for kellogg's and and maybe a sort of a secondary question then how have you as a business responded to some of the challenges that you've faced? Well, thank you for having me firstly. Um, I think, you know, when I was reflecting ahead of this session, um, really what I would say is that whilst Kellogg's, we have had to adapt, obviously, like everyone has, I think we were quite lucky in some respects because a lot of the principles that we had in place already allowed us to, to react and be agile. Um, you know, when you were, 130 year old company you can quite often be stuck in legacy ways of working which reduce agility but actually prior to covid we made quite a big structural change to the business to allow us that um versatility callum mentioned for example we uh with e-commerce which is the channel that i work in we'd already identified it as the fastest growing um sales channel and so we have built internal resource to be more strategic and identify where we needed to build muscle in order to become a, a leading supplier in that area. Um, so we were able to pivot and obviously massive acceleration. Callum stole a, a, a stat that I was going to use around the growth of e-commerce during first lockdown. I think we, we, we noted it down, I think, as 10 years worth of growth over an eight week period in the first lockdown. Um, so it massively accelerated a lot of the projects that we we're working on. Um, and what we're trying to do now, obviously, is um, now the dust is settling a little, perhaps, um, understanding what the future means and, uh, and, you know, what trends will be for consumers moving forward. There were some elements of what we do and how we innovate, particularly around our innovation pipeline, uh, where we did have to make some um, kind of quick decisions. Um, Callum, we obviously work a lot with Zeal, so we speak the same language quite often, but um, a lot of our innovation and marketing and, and product development is uh, shaped around occasions. So when are people eating throughout the day um, and where do we want to play within those occasions? You know, we deal in snacking and breakfast products. Um, so there are key occasions for us to get after. And one of the big ones that we'd identified pre-COVID was the on-the-go occasion. People don't have enough time to, um, to sit down at a breakfast table and eat uh, in the morning or even on the way home or perhaps even during lunch. You know, we're all so busy nowadays. Um, and we had a whole 
uh, innovation pipeline around that on the go occasion lined up. And obviously, um, you know, during COVID and during the lockdowns, we pretty much saw that on the go occasion at times reduced to almost zero uh, in lots of cases for our target consumer. And so we had to make some some changes and some pivots there. But um, but generally speaking, I think, you know, um, we we obviously have, have seen trends go up and down and there's a lot of uncertainty, but the agility that we've got in place is allowing us to pivot. And what I would just, I did just make a note to call out because you called it, uh, Wes mentioned it earlier in his um, presentation, which I thought was excellent, by the way, um, was the how impressed I've been by Kellogg's in terms of how they've treated uh, me and the rest of the employees during the pandemic, because we feel incredibly, I feel incredibly lucky that the flexibility um, and the support and the, the genuine care for emotional um, uh, kind of well-being of staff and the checking in uh, that they've instilled has been second to none. So um, I do want to call that out. And it's important as well, because I think nowadays consumers are also starting to look at brands from an employee, uh, an employee welfare perspective as well. You know, we're so well connected. We have access to information nowadays and uh, and perhaps that may start to influence. I'm sure it does already influence how people shop and who they shop with. And, and Kellogg's has been brilliant in that respect. Now, that's a, a really, really interesting point, actually, there, Joe. Thank you. Um, Ellen, just to, to bring you into the conversation, you've had experience of, of working across lots of other sectors as well. So just thinking of those challenges, have you had similar experiences? What, what challenges are being faced by other brands in, in other sectors that might be in line with, with some of the things that Joe and Callum have talked about? And, and where, where have you seen any differences? Yeah, I think the, the experience has been has been fairly fairly similar for loads of other categories. And you know, the, the acceleration of e-commerce that Callum was talking about is certainly something we've seen across categories, even in industries that you know traditionally um, are not really relying on, on e-commerce. So we have um, automotive clients and they really had to adapt quickly when retailers were closed. And you know, even though um, they couldn't sell at the time, it was still important to stay top of mind for uh, customers. So brands uh, that we work for, like Skoda and, and the rest of the uh, VW group, for example, offered uh, experience that were virtual, so um, virtual showrooms where a real expert, so a human, you know, working um, at home where the dealership is closed, can kind of take you on a tour of the vehicle that is parked on here or on his or her driveway. Um, and then, you know, now the dealerships have reopened, um, they have kept uh, this um, this experience because it's been working quite well. And actually, uh, without COVID, um, we wouldn't have seen those mindsets uh, change that fast. Um, so, you know, that 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 has definitely um, changed the landscape for for the good, I think, because it also makes it potentially more uh, accessible um, if you couldn't go to a dealer, for example. Um, and. And during the, the discussion, you know, I thought it was really interesting, Callum mentioned this, this real fragmentation of shopper mindset and how, um, you know, how customers have um, a, a bit less money or um, have more disposable income. And again, this is something that we're seeing in the automotive industry and that is really impacting today. So consumers are really trading up or down depending on their circumstances and and it's really interesting actually to see that a lot of automotive brands um, are, are in this um, this ranking um, what I've noticed though is that um, the it's more premium brands and more brands that have um, embraced the 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 electric vehicle um, uh, technology so you know we can see that Jaguar I was really surprised that they are um, you know the brand that is at the top uh, when you look only at automotive but also Tesla, Ford so these are really leading the change uh, and the charge in terms of um, brands that are most connected which is really interesting and I think really illustrates this change of mindset that um, Callum was talking about. Thanks everyone some really really interesting and useful comments there. So Wes also took us through how the top performing brands performed across each of our most connected brand measures. And what I want to focus on for a moment is, is emotion, where historically, if we think about FMCG brands, they, they typically always do quite well there. So Joe, just coming back to you, is that emotional connection something that Kellogg's wants to concentrate on? Or do you think the focus might be more on innovation going forward? 
Well, I mean, in, in regards to what matters to our consumers, um, we know that um, they have big expectations of companies like Kellogg's to show leadership in corporate social, uh, social responsibility and creating the future of food, um, and rightly so, right? So, uh, and critically as well, these expectations, by the way, are equally important to our customers. So the retailers, the Tesco's, the Asda's, the Amazon's of this world, um, so it really aligns with them. And again, you know, it's similar to what I said before, we, we'd already done a lot of work to redevelop what we call our wellbeing manifesto um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, and again, this provided a solid platform for us to build on in the new reality. Um, so essentially it focuses on three pillars, which is um, people, the planet and community. Um, so in regards to people, firstly, obviously we're a food company. Um, we have massive uh, commitments to reducing sugar and salt in our food. That means innovation across our biggest brands. So these principles kind of lie, lie as the bedrock for all of the work that we want to do and how we want to change our portfolio. Uh, for the planet, um, we're going to be making significant reductions to the packaging and carbon that's in our production processes. I think 100% of our packaging will be recyclable by 2025. Um, and, you know, we're constantly exploring initiatives for how we can reduce that overall food waste, um, including in Manchester, working with a local brewery and making beer out of our less than perfect cereal, which I know Callum's very familiar with because uh, they sell it on the premises where our offices are based. Um, and, then, uh, and then community. Um, so we've always had a massive community project supporting people in need. It remains as prominent as ever. Um, today, we've launched our School Breakfast Clubs initiative, 23rd consecutive year, and by 2030, we'll feed, um, I think, I think we'll provide 33 million foods via food banks across Europe. So I guess to answer your question, and more so than perhaps historically, that wellbeing manifesto is, is now the driver of all of our innovation and how we think as a, as a company, we're going to I don't want to make any claims that aren't uh, exactly right, but we're going to inc increase the amount of uh, fibre and vitamins. So every product that we sell has a certain amount of fibre or vitamins within it by a certain year as well. So um, it kind of acts as a cycle, really. We don't really innovate for any other reason other than, you know, what, what rings true to us um, and our principles. And, and we believe, and, and it ties in really nicely, I think, with what Wes was saying, because it was so relevant in so many of the pillars that he, he focused on. We know that this is what matters to consumers, particularly young consumers as well, that are coming through that next generation, Generation Z, massively engaged and informed around the world that's changing around us. And um, what I would say, to be very honest, is that we perhaps need to do a better job of communicating what we're doing through our above and below the line marketing uh, strategies and communication. And that's something that we'll be working on. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it coming to life. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Callum, and, and just to you, is that a similar focus for some of the other brands you've been working on? What sort of things have you been seeing from, from this perspective? Yeah, I, th I think that the debate is that all of these different elements aren't, aren't mutually exclusive. We're seeing how we've got this kind of blended living and these new opportunities. And, you know, there's, there's been this age old debate around brand building versus sales activation. And that's always quite annoyed me because why do the two need to be exclusive you, you know at zeal we talk about effective equity and absolutely we need to deliver effectiveness and deliver sales for our clients but do it in a way that that builds brand equity um through innovation perhaps but you know builds that brand emotion and the pandemic gave grocery brands across our portfolio you know the perfect opportunity to do this and to really live their their brand values um you know and the the entire world changed overnight and i think in many ways grocery brands and grocery shopping you know were the last bastions of kind of normality uh, in a world that had been turned upside down actually going out in lockdown to go to the supermarket although very different it felt like a connection to, to kind of reality and quite emotive so so pivoting our plans to demonstrate that empathy and that emotion and, and changing communications and, and showing that real understanding of, of shopper situations were, were key you know yes we were helping clients and brands to remain effective but we were activating in ways that meant we could we could truly be relevant to the way that the things that they were living through again take the work that we've been leading with joe and his team developing e-commerce toolkits for for markets across europe again it was ensuring that we're really effective and, and innovating in an accelerating channel but actually really connecting 
with shoppers on an emotive level too and and actually bringing them some in some enjoyment and comfort in in difficult times thank you and i think i you know i i can't get over how excited I, I used to be at my weekly shop to my local supermarket and getting out the house. It, it really was quite exciting. Um, Ellen, looking at the, the massive increase in social media usage, and I think probably all of us could admit to maybe looking at Facebook or Twitter or Instagram a lot more than, than we used to. Is it a tool that brands could leverage to help make some of those connections that, that Callum and Joe have been talking about and what have you seen that's changed in this area over the last as in 18 months or so yeah so I mean the first big increase we've seen is obviously an increase in in usage you know both of uh, mobile and social media usage and actually we've talked a lot about TikTok which has seen this huge increase but it's something that every social media platform has seen uh maybe you know in a, a lesser lesser numbers of people joining but you know the traditional facebook's and instagram have also seen seen that increase um tiktok is super impressive because people spend a, an incredible amount of time on it you know uh, on average 20 hours a month um uh, is the latest uh, data i've seen and um, if you have a think about how much time this is per day, and this is an average, this is quite a lot. Um, what's also interesting to see is that um, in your uh, in your study, we can see that um, some brands like you know Netflix, Amazon with Amazon Prime, and also Disney are amongst the brands that have been really resonating uh, with consumers. And I think Wes mentioned this need for for escapism and. And I think that consumers uh, really liking Netflix and Disney Plus and et cetera is really showing that they're happy to engage with, with long form content. And we see that much more now than, than we used to, you know, in social, it was all about um, as short as possible, put your brand right at the beginning because people are gonna drop off. And actually we can see that this is less and less true. Um, and for us, brands should really start looking at including this, this longer form content um, in their plan to really offer you know that offers ways to make those connections when you have uh, 20 minutes versus uh, 30 seconds you can definitely build a lot more of your uh, brand story your emotions etc social media I really believe um offers you you know ways to move away from the traditional um formats that we used to you know the 30 second tv ad and you know and the short radio commercials or or the print um you can really if you want create an ad that lasts an hour um, as long as it's uh, in, uh, interesting, uh, you know, it's it's up to you and you can host it on your on your own um, YouTube channels. Um, and and what's interesting as well and what I love is that we do offer ways to um, for consumers to feedback and to engage as well. So that gives you another dimension and and helps you see if you're actually building this connection or if you should change the way you approach things. So, um, for example, at Ogilvy recently, um, we, we ran a campaign with Coca-Cola for the Olympics and the idea was to really reach uh, Gen Z who are a bit less engaged with the with the Olympics and um, part of the campaign as part of you know many types of assets was those YouTube videos that were about 20 minutes long and they were telling the story of young athletes um, around around the world so you had obviously a lot of Coca-Cola and Olympics uh, branding um, and um, and through these these stories you know we were able to obviously illustrate the values of the Olympics and and Coca-Cola and as I said they were about 20 minutes minutes uh, long and uh, we were really pleasantly surprised to see view through rates up to 90 percent so that means that people are watching really uh, almost the entire video which is really surprising and, and for me is really showing this big shift um, in in people's mindset and the way they can consume advertising on social so definitely something I would look at um, for for brand strategies on how to really leverage social to um, to create this connection Brilliant. Thank you. That really is that really is fascinating. Um, I think we've got five or so minutes left. Um, I think I've seen a few questions come in. Terry, can I ask you to share what, what you feel would be best shared with the panel? Yeah. Any questions there? Sure. Yeah, definitely. We actually have Chris from uh, Wasserman. He's going to actually ask his question live. Uh, so. Chris will be joining us. He's a part of the Alliance member agency. There he is. Hello, Chris. Wow, that was good timing. Sorry, Terry, had a small technical fart there. 
Um, <laughs> thanks, panelists. Really, really interesting. Question from me is, um, where do you think the new normal is going to settle? We heard the Skoda example from Hélène and, and Callum was talking about e-commerce. If everything shot into the stratosphere one way during the pandemic, where do you think it's going to settle compared to the previous normal? Well, I think that's a great question. I'm happy to jump in if you want, Debbie. Um, yeah, no, no, go ahead. I think it's, I'm going to tee up a bit of your own research, Debbie. I saw it kind of a few months ago in terms of an opinion piece in terms of these two divided camps in terms of people that actually want to forge this amazing kind of new future and go in this direction versus those that really want to get back to normality. Um, so that's really interesting in that perspective. I think we've seen things like that e-commerce penetration peak has, has kind of come back down, you know, and again, to, from an agency perspective to, to quote Bill Birnbeck and you know we need to be obsessed with the unchanging man I think there will be some of that but I think it's those sticky behaviors that will be really interesting so again I just answered a question in the chat I think some of those things like blended experiences where you can actually you can have a lovely wine tasting or cocktail tasting in that experience but you can do it with a digital element kind of at home as well so those kind of those things that kind of pull the best bits of the the pandemic so to speak you know with the kind of experiences that we really want to kind of love and return to so I think yeah we, we do want to kind of get back to normal but it's those key sticky behaviors which is a, a marketing term I keep hearing banded around which will be really interesting and I would say as well it will depend probably on the on the category and you know for some things I think you know, we would have never, um, I'm sure the NHS would have never wanted to only offer um, telephone appointments for GPs, but actually it's probably a, a, um, quite an efficient uh, cost saving and, and time saving um, uh, way of dealing with patients that don't have a really big issue that means that you don't need to see them. So I could see those behaviors sticking because, you know, um, they make sense um, for both the consumer and the, and the people leading um, and, and the companies, you know, uh, for things like uh, like Skoda, the virtual showroom um, is still live and is still something you can access. And I think that it's it's um, it's also creating, as I was saying earlier, experiences that are much more accessible. So, you know, if you are um, in a wheelchair, it may not be um, very easy for you to to go to a dealer. Now you can, you know, access this experience just live. And those are things that, you know, um, if there's only a few things that are positive that COVID brought, I think that this is this is really part of it. And this will stay because it really makes sense for some consumers. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Thank you, Ellen. Terry, have we got hopefully Chris that answers your your question? <laughs> It's disappeared. <laughs> Terry, have we got any other questions there? Yeah, we've got another one that's come in the chat. Uh, this is from Nick Baker, and he has asked, how has the financial services sector performed in this study? Do you see the challenger and fintech startups performing more like other non-financial services brands? Wes, I'm going to pull you in here. We've got Wes live in the flesh. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Hi, hi there, Nick. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, to answer your question very poorly, um, so the only traditional retail bank that um, appeared in the list was um, HSBC, I believe, in 98 place, which if you think about what those brands allow us to achieve, they, they put homes, you know, roofs over our head, they allow us to save up for our children's futures. The fact that they don't, we don't engage with them in, in, that, in that sort of emotional way is, is really um, quite disappointing. And also, I think to, to even now is probably a little bit coloured by, um, you know, the, the, the recession that we went through a few years ago and just the, the, the huge damage they, they, that, you know, that, that did to that sector. Um, the brands that do perform well are ones that their core product or sector isn't financial services. So it will be the like of Apple Pay. Google Pay, so where they you know, their, their brand means so much more than just financial services. And you can even cynically kind of imagine that those brands aren't necessarily seeing financial services as where their bread and butter, but an ability to gain more information and more data around around customers. Um, so yeah, so I guess it is quite damning for, for traditional sort of high, you know, high street retail banks. 
Great, thank you, Wes. Well, I think we're probably reaching the end of our, our time now. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I hope everybody's found that really interesting and useful. If there are any other questions or comments or anything that you'd like to talk to us about in any more detail, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So please do get in touch. Um, so just thank you from me to everybody that, that joined in on the panel and to everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.